First television screens, then computer screens, now tablet and smartphone screens. Screens have inundated and changed our lives for a full decade now. The internet, social networks, games and videos devour one third of our waking hours. The typical preschool child spends between four and six hours a day in front of a screen of some kind. In nearly every country, children are spending far more time with screens than the recommended allowance. There is a proliferation of alarming studies. We're finding dramatic changes in the brain and in the behavior of these maze. So we should be concerned about this. Our neurons might be in danger. People ask me, why don't you have a Facebook account? Because I know what it does to your brain. Teenagers get addicted. Is today's screen generation really an unhealthy generation? There's a lot of questions out there. Are screens okay? How much is okay? How much is too much for my child? So how do we form healthy digital habits? And what are the scientific facts? At this very moment, laboratories across the whole world are studying the impact digital tools have on behavior, the brain, and medical health. This is a very young literature. Let me give you a little perspective. It takes about 20 years to establish an effect in science. 20 years. Tablets and the fact that they began to be used by very young children is at most seven year old or eight years old. We are doing it commercially before we have actually done the science. I would much rather we do the science first and then we say, oh, is it safe or not? That alarm was first sounded by psychologists, psychiatrists and paediatricians after in-the-field work with children. We head to Rony-sous-Bois, just outside Paris. Iman, a young mother, and her daughter Malia are in to see Dr. Dieu Osika for the second time. Ton tour, elle est où ma princesse? Coucou Malia, bonjour, bonjour madame. Installez-vous, on va rediscuter un petit peu. Où est-ce qu'elle en est, notre petite Malia? Ça lui fait quel âge? Euh, deux ans et euh, quatre mois. Moi, j'étais un petit peu embêtée parce que Malia ne parlait pas beaucoup, elle avait des petits troubles de l'humeur. In 20 years as a paediatrician, Dr. Dio Osika has witnessed the sharp rise in screens in tiny children's lives and the mounting problems. Tous ces enfants qui sont dans des troubles des interactions, j'en ai beaucoup plus qu'auparavant. Des troubles du caractère, il y a toujours eu des enfants difficiles évidemment, mais là il y en a beaucoup plus avec euh, l'absence de limites, euh, intolérance à la frustration, colère importante, troubles du langage, un langage pauvre, mal structuré, voire une absence de langage. Baleine. 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 Voilà. Voilà, tu as beaucoup changé, Mania. Je suis très contente. Tu es sage, tu parles de mieux en mieux. Barely six months ago, Malia was spending up to six hours a day watching screens. Morning cartoon shows, meals in front of the TV, YouTube videos on the mobile phone after naps. Taking the pediatrician's advice, the mother stopped all of that. Là, maintenant, il y a une interaction. 
alors qu'avant, euh, voilà, elle était... Euh, vous avez dit un mot super euh, important, vous avez parlé d'interaction. Ouais. C'est essentiel, ouais. ça, parce qu'il n'y avait plus d'interaction, puisqu'il y avait l'écran qui était entre vous deux. C'est ça. Hein, entre ça. papa et elle, ou entre vous et elle. Donc, voilà. très clairement, ça modifie les choses. Complètement. Les écrans, c'est un, un, un enjeu de santé publique majeur actuellement, dont on n'a absolument pas pris conscience. The pediatrician's waiting room has all the usual prevention campaign posters, but also messages to raise awareness of the dangers of screens. Schools are also now wary of screens. Primary school teachers must cope with an increase in mood and language disorders. Today, many professionals in the field of early childcare suspect screens of being a cause of many of these disorders. Numerous epidemiological studies conducted worldwide justify the rising concern. For a number of years, people have tracked exposure to screens um, in young children. And what they found is that on average, if there are higher amounts of screen exposure, this can be associated with some negative outcomes. A disruption to sleep, disruption to attention, disruption to weight, and disruption to learning. Scientists consider that for toddlers aged three and under, exposure is excessive when it exceeds two to three hours per day. The problem is that the digital offer is sparking growing consumption, and at earlier ages than ever. In the 1970s, most children didn't start watching TV before the age of four. Today, screens enter their lives at just four months old. For one-third of toddlers under age two, exposure currently exceeds 90 minutes per day. It then climbs to three hours per day, even six in the USA. In our digital era, many children spend over a third of their waking hours absorbing video content. What are the results of this? Rather surprisingly, it is difficult for scientists to answer that question. The phenomenon is more complex than it appears, and experiments that must be carried out to analyze it are sometimes rather odd. Dr. Dimitri Christakis heads the Center for Child Health Behavior and Brain Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute. He is a pioneer in research on small screens. We followed thousands of children uh, from birth to age seven. And what we found was that the more television children watched before the age of three, the more likely they were to have attentional problems later in life, at school age. He and his team think these programs pace is what causes problems in children's brains. So the hypothesis that we had was that prolonged exposure to that rapidly sequenced media would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input, and this would lead to inattention later in life. Stated otherwise, a young brain regularly exposed to high levels of pictures and sounds would, in the long term, have problems concentrating on tasks that require time, such as reading and writing. But does this sensorial bombardment set off actual observed problems in children being studied? Because epidemiological studies are always subject to the criticism that they can't prove a causal relationship. The next logical step normally would be to conduct an experiment, what we call a randomized controlled trial. In this case, that would mean taking infants, exposing half of them to fast-paced programming, the other half to none, and following them, as we did in our epidemiological studies, for seven years. There would be no ethical or practical way to do that. And so, in a sense, uh, we were at an impasse. The only workaround? Conduct the experiment anyway, but on young mice. So what we really kind of created was sort of TV for mice, where we had the sounds coordinate with these lights to kind of put on a show, if you will, for the animals. The programs here start the same time every day. You're too slow! We 
have lots of different cartoons that we layer on top of each other, and then we change the frequency of the cartoon so that the mice can hear it. We have a lot of lights that surround the cages, and we have them flash, and the flashes coincide with the sounds that we play. How about this? Ninja Joe at night. We do that for six hours per day, and the mice um, that we're giving the stimulation to, it starts at 10 days after birth, and it goes for 40 days. The arrangement may look strange. Bombarding young mice with flashes of light set to the rhythm of cartoon soundtracks imperfectly reflects what a small child experiences in front of a TV. However, it is the only model available for testing the hypothesis. Dozens of young mice have undergone the treatment. Their behavior is studied from every possible angle and compared to unexposed mice. The result? The mice raised six hours a day in front of this mock TV do not behave normally. What we find with a normal mouse is that they'll stay around the perimeter here. They like to explore, but they want to stay safe. When we take those mice that underwent the sensory stimulation, they have a much different pattern of behavior. So they'll run around the maze like crazy, and then they spend a lot of time going into the center of the maze, which we would consider to be much more risky. And so the way that we interpret that kind of behavior is that the mice are impulsive. Heightened impulsiveness, but also cognitive problems. Tests reveal learning difficulties, lower memory capacity, a handful of clues that hint at concentration problems. What we see in humans in observational studies is that exposure to rapid-paced programming early in life decreases attention and increases impulsivity. And we find the same thing to be true in a mouse model. That's the current state of evidence in 2019. Even if the pertinence of the model has been criticized by certain scientists, these results bolster the suspicion that most physicians espouse that screens are bad for our health. Le grand intérêt de l'étude de Christakis, c'est vraiment d'attirer notre attention sur euh, le fait que des stimulations lumineuses intenses euh, auxquelles le bébé ne peut pas donner de sens vont pouvoir avoir chez lui des conséquences importantes en termes d'anxiété, d'angoisse, de déstabilisation de son monde intérieur, d'insécurité. Et euh, le danger est évidemment qu'ensuite, euh, eh il soit en recherche permanente de stimulations toujours semblables qu'il cherche à apprivoiser, euh, mais sans y arriver jamais. With a soaring number of digital devices, TV screen time is not the only worry. Cell phones and tablets now clutter our daily existence. They wriggle their way into our relationships, even the most fundamental ones. Today, screens are suspected of harming parent-child relationships. Från början så handlar det mycket om tv. Man har tvn på i bakgrunden, man tittar på, på, på program som kanske inte är gjorda för barn. Det stör ut interaktionen mellan barnet och vuxna. Nu handlar det mer om kanske hur mycket mobilen stör våra interaktioner med varandra. Hur mycket stör den här apparaten som vi har med oss hela tiden och pockar på vår uppmärksamhet. Hur mycket stör det vårt samspel? To answer this question, the Child and Infant Lab is currently monitoring 115 families in and around Linköping, Sweden. The aim is to gather precise data on families' digital habits and their impact on cognitive development. Studies on hundreds of infants demonstrate that the earlier cell phone screens make their ways into babies' lives, the later they begin to speak. Even parents' constant use of cell phones may hinder children's language development. However, as these studies are based solely on parents' self-reporting, the data are not entirely reliable. For the first time, Linköping University will collect precise data on babies' digital environments by placing spy microphones into babies' clothes. Och då kan vi genom de analyserna som den här apparaten gör se vad som händer under dagen. Inte bara 
vad som eh, det ljudet vi hör men också till exempel hur många ord pratar en vuxen under en dag, hur många ord säger barnet under en dag och hur många interaktioner är de. Men man kan faktiskt också med hjälp av den här apparaten analysera hur mycket av dagen är digitalt ljud. With this method, researchers can detect whether families digital habits are influencing their interactions with their babies and can evaluate the consequences on their later language development. Om man har väldigt lite ord så kommer man inte lära sig språket på samma sätt och det här har vi sett i våran studie. Sen ser det också så att om man har mycket digitala media så kanske man inte hinner prata lika mycket med sitt barn för man är upptagen med någonting annat och då får digitala media också en konsekvens. But the study on growing up in the digital world has only just begun. To confirm that the omnipresence of screens affects language acquisition, even cognitive development, we must wait until all these children under study have reached talking age. Programs that disrupt attention spans, screens suspected of harming parent-child relationships, of hindering language learning. Irrefutable proof is still lacking to condemn digital devices definitively, but scientists have found another key factor. The brains of children under the age of two cannot analyze what is happening on a screen. One thing that we really need to consider is that it's very hard for children to navigate between the 2D and the 3D world. Um, it is hard for them to transfer information and to understand that things that are on the screen are the same out in the real world. Infants' difficulty with screens was revealed in experiments conducted by Dr. Georgine Trosseth, a psychology professor at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. Here is one of her experiments on a toddler under age two. Professor Trosseth hides a stuffed toy in a room as the child watches her do this on a monitor. The child is told to go find it in the room, which he has never seen before in real life. Will he locate the toy as easily as if he had not watched the scene on the monitor? Where do you think he is? The answer is no. It's very difficult for them to learn. It's more difficult than a face-to-face -face interaction. And this difficulty we've found is about 50% less learning from a screen than from a live interaction. And this difference has been called the transfer deficit. Before age two, nothing viewed on a screen can be directly transposed to real life. To find the neurological source of this difficulty, Professor Rachel Barr's team is now investigating using cutting-edge technology. Her goal, film the brain right in the middle of a deficit transfer. In this experiment, Clara, age four, must learn via a video chat how to position a toy robot's articulated arms and legs. Can I show you this one, Clara? All right, let's see. Look at that. Can you show me what I showed you on yours? Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing with you. Wow. This? Can you hold it up a little bit? When the demonstration is run using a screen, just like with a stuffed toy experiment, most often the children fail. But this time, brain activity is being measured during the exam. Apparently, exchange via a screen does not stimulate the brain's learning centre the same way that face-to-face -face interaction does. There is more activation in the frontal parietal cortex when a baby is learning from a live interaction than when they are copying from a video chat. And we think that that's, it's only preliminary, uh, but we think it's really exciting um, because it suggests that what the information that you're processing uh, differs and this could partially account for this transfer deficit, this difficulty in picking up information. 
Creative brains treat virtual action differently from real action. This remains a mystery. One, two, three. However, scientists have found a way to palliate this difficulty. When a parent accompanies a child and takes pains to put words to the action on the screen, the learning hurdle diminishes, but only somewhat. Where's the car? Where's the car on the TV? Can you point to the car on the TV? No, but come point on the TV. Come up on the, and touch on the TV. Oh, there it is. On-screen action remains less stimulating for young brains than real-life action. Therefore, any time that little ones spend in front of screens is essentially wasted time for them. Un enfant de moins de trois ans a peu de temps d'éveil, donc il faut absolument qu'il utilise ce temps d'éveil pour les acquisitions cognitives et sociales indispensables à cet âge. Avant trois ans, évitons les écrans autant que ce que nous évitons le biftec dans le biberon. Euh, il est bien évident que l'estomac du bébé ne digère pas ses nourritures et en même temps, le cerveau du bébé ne peut pas digérer les écrans. No screens before age two or three. That's the official recommendation of most scientific and medical academies worldwide. Up to age five or six, they advise a limit of one hour per day, preferably accompanying the child. Mealtimes and bedtimes should be screen free. What about later though? At age six, 10, 15? With age, the digital landscape becomes more complex. In addition to cartoon shows, there are video games, cell phones, social networks. So what precautions are needed for big kids? We're in a residential area of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the McCormack's home. Here, as in most American homes, life centers around the TV. No meals at the table. Even homework is done in front of the TV. Miranda, the mother, makes the meals and spends the rest of her time policing their screen usage. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. You're welcome, Charlie. There's enough room for everybody. Yeah, but this is the best view. That's the best spot? We have Charlie's chicken. Yeah, is there honey in it? Is this, no, there's not. Is this what you're watching? We're not changing the channel while, while we're eating. Okay. Screen time rules and limits are no big deal with Trevor and Anthony. They know the rules and they pretty well stick to the rules and they're grateful that they get to have screen time. With the little ones, um, Screen time is definitely a topic of arguments. Danny, age eight, and Charlie, age six, have grown up with consoles and cell phones. Getting up off the couch is always negotiated with video game time. Can I play the Xbox? <laughs> Only for an hour. Okay, so it's 5.12. At 6.12, your time is up. Okay? 6.12? Mm-hmm. My, can um, I still like start the game before the time starts? Like, just I'll have to wait for this to load, wait for it to load more. And then... Okay, but time starts, okay? <laughs> That's part of playing the game, I'm sorry. It's fine, you'll be fine. In the USA, kids under 12 spend an average four hours and 40 minutes per day with screens. Past age 13, the daily average climbs to six hours and 40 minutes. Watching videos remains the main activity. But we must also add time spent on social network, video games, surfing the internet. In one school year, a teenager spends more time in front of the TV and cell phone than in front of teachers. 
This craze for screens ranges from Fortnite to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, Snapchat, Netflix, WhatsApp, Amazon, Tinder, Twitter, Tumblr, Via Dio, Meetup, Flickr, Pinterest, Periscope, Mix Mix. Dis Is any of this suitable for adolescents, a critical period of brain development? Is everybody ready to go? Yeah. We're about to leave. Hey, Trinity, are you ready? This morning, Trinity, age 11, and Trevor, 12, have a special meeting. They've been participating for a year and a half now in the largest study ever conducted on teenage brain development. Are you sitting up front? It's not that bad. Did you not get a Every three months, the siblings go to the Tulsa Brain Research Institute to undergo a battery of tests. The ABCD study is um, close to 12,000 uh, children across the country in 21 centers. There is uh, Portland, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, Salt Lake City, Denver, there is um, St. Louis, and then there's obviously Tulsa, and uh, it's the largest of its kind. First stage in the day for Trevor and Trinity is to give a detailed report of their daily digital habits. Time per day, would you say you text on a cell phone, tablet, computer, iPod, or other electronic device? An hour. How much time per day do you uh, visit social media apps such as Snapchat or Facebook, or Twitter, Instagram, or stuff like that? An hour. How often do you play mature rated video games like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or Assassin's Creed? I don't play video games. Do you? watch or stream movies or TV shows? Such as Hulu, Netflix, or Amazon? Like during summer or holiday? Two hours. Two hours? Two hours, 30 minutes? Awesome. Digital practices are numerous. Our aim is to identify those that might create problems for developing vulnerable young brains. The second decade of life, um, you will see dramatic changes in the brain. Um, what happens is that the brain continues to mature during that period and really uh, transforms from a child brain to an adult brain. The brain develops, the neurons kind of move around and shift. We see all of those kind of changes, particularly in the areas that we think about our personality. So impulse control, decision making, uh, emotional regulation, all of that happens really critically during this period of life. Along with Trevor and Trinity, thousands of teenagers in the study regularly get brain scans. Paradoxically, to prevent them from fidgeting during the exams, they get to watch a cartoon. The study has only just begun, but it has already led to a first discovery. The brains of children who play lots of video games have particular features. What I'm showing here are differences for kids who spend a lot of their times playing video games rather than other types of screen media. What we found in our first analysis is in the front of the brain or the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for emotional development, um, decision making, things like that. It's developed a little bit faster than their peers. We don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. We don't know um, if video games cause that or if it just happens to be that kids who have a slightly more developed brain happen to like video games more. Answering this question is the goal for a second section of the ABCD study. Memory capacity, concentration, emotionalism, psychological balance. The 12,000 participants receive individual psychological evaluations. At this stage, I would say, as long as you're aware of uh, what your child is doing, um, and as long as you don't see significant problems, either at school, at home, uh, with peers, I would not worry about it. We don't really have uh, good evidence at this point that there are significant problems. If you notice that there are problems because the kid has problems at school, uh, maybe is, uh, uh, feels particularly anxious or has temper tantrums, that's when I would look at it more closely. The ABCD study's broad conclusions will be reached by the time Trevor and Trinity are young adults. In other words, not before 2027.
There is nevertheless one issue that these scientists need to address promptly, and it is on the minds of parents in every nation. With this level of consumption, is the new generation slipping into screen addiction? And what is behind screen's strange hypnotic power? Professor Ophia Turrell of California State University in Fullerton analyzes how brains apprehend social networks. In his view, these applications are optimized to confiscate users' time and attention. In face-to-face, -face, normal daily interactions, we get uh, several dozens of rewards per day. But on social media, we have the same thing on a much larger scale. As opposed to getting a few taps on the shoulder, a few nice words being said to us, we have hundreds, sometimes thousands of friends that communicate with us and provide us with rewards such as likes, such as commenting on our uh, posts, such as reposting our opinions and so on, and that makes us really feel good. Thanks to brain imaging, Professor Jarrell has even identified the mechanism that social networks deploy to hijack our neurons. As with most addictive behaviors, the reward circuit is involved. The reward circuit is a tiny cerebral region nested in the core of our brains. It controls sensations of pleasure. It lights up when we eat, when we make love, and when we use drugs. Our research showed that it fires up also when we are exposed to images of social media, and certainly when we see likes on social media. So it teaches our brain to want more of it. And over time, the system can become very sensitized, so it responds almost automatically to any cues that relate to social media. And by automatically, I mean you cannot even control the behavior because it's too fast. Your brain just tells you, I want that, you do that, without having the opportunity to reflect and say to yourself, hey, stop for a second. Therefore, the reward circuit's gateway is tapped by social networks to monopolize our attention. But the mechanics involved are more pernicious still, because the likes can pop up at any moment. For our brains, they offer unpredictable, random rewards. And as Professor Skinner showed with his famous pigeon experiment, it's the best way to set off compulsive behavior. What he has demonstrated is that if we expose pigeons to a fixed schedule of reward by giving them food every fixed number of times they pick, let's say five times, they repeat the behavior, but they do not go crazy about it. In contrast, when you expose them to a variable schedule of rewards, now it is not fixed. Maybe after five pecks they get a, a, the food, maybe after 10, sometimes after 20 pecks. Then the pigeons would go crazy. They would seek the reward more often, they would peck more, and they would continue pecking even after the reward is terminated. This power of random rewards for behavior is a constant in the animal world. It works in rats, in monkeys, and even more so in humans. The game industry has long prospered by targeting this psychological vulnerability. Social networks are merely recycling the recipe in order to better capture our time and our attention. Have we then unwittingly become the internet's pigeons? Has the world become one gigantic Skinner box where we wander about searching for small rewards scattered by the giants of the web? The pigeon experiment may draw smiles, but the underlying issue is serious. The digital industry strategies for capturing attention are full steam at work. We pick up our cell phones 200 times per day on average. And for video gamers, the phenomenon is even more impressive. For some gamers, the practice borders on drug addiction. 
an officially recognized problem in the medical field since June 2018. L'addiction aux jeux vidéo est depuis aujourd'hui considérée comme une maladie par l'Organisation mondiale de la santé au même titre que la dépendance à la cocaïne ou aux jeux d'argent. Décision prise après la consultation d'experts dans le monde entier. Everybody who indulges in gaming from time to time doesn't have this disorder. It's, in fact, it's only a minority of people who game who will satisfy the strict criteria for gaming disorder and there is need and demand for treatment from many regions of the world. The WHO stipulates that the diagnosis applies to players whose lack of control in gaming has harmed their social and family lives, their schooling or professional lives for 12 months at least. Centres dedicated to this new type of addiction are popping up around Europe. China has been dealing with the matter in its own way for 10 years now. The country already has over 750 million video players. There will be a billion gamers by 2022. Given the sharp rise in consumption of games, Chinese officials say it is a public health issue. In Europe, an estimated 2.5% of gamers slip into this form of cyber dependence. The statistical variance likely reflects cultural differences. In China, gaming is deemed a social plague. Dozens of treatment institutes now offer cures to overwhelmed parents for their addicted offspring. We are in Weifong, a metropolis in Shandong province. The Senzing Rehabilitation Center houses 100 patients aged 12 to 18 years old. Children sent to Sensing are at odds with their families, some because of video games. Dependence is viewed here as a deviance. The director Wang Mai Long treats it with a simple method discipline. The children have two hours of military training daily. Meditation and introspection exercises at regular intervals daily. The goal? Reinsert them into Chinese society. Conformity. South Korea and the USA also have rehabilitation centers for video game addicts. But in these countries, the aim is more to get the youngsters outdoors in the greenery for a few weeks. China uses harsh discipline. Hu Haoyu is 14 years old. He arrived two months ago without knowing where he'd be sent, nor that he'd stay here an entire year. Since arriving here, Hao Yu has had no contact with his family. But today, he's in for a surprise. 
？要不要妈妈？啊？要不要妈妈吗？不过了。How you has always been a bit of a solitary and withdrawn child, but six months ago he suddenly plunged deep into gaming, to the point that that is all he did all day, all night, losing sleep, putting his health at risk. <laughs> 挺好的，挺好的。能不能吃饱啊？能。能吃饱吗？然后呢，就是一直停不下来，就是把时间观念什么都忘了。然后呢，嗯、呃，可能，嗯、呃，有时候就是上厕所时候必须停下来的时候，然后就是有时候就是突然停下来之后，然后就会，嗯、呃，眼睛就会特别的看东西就会特别的黑，有时候头特别晕，然后视野模糊什么的。然后呢，就有时候，比如说出门的时候。就是可能站的，就是站的时间站不长，就是就是呃坐一会儿就是得坐下休息一会儿那种感觉。然后呢，我也也意识到这样接下来可能就是会啊、呃、身体越来越差什么的，但是意意识上是想停下来，但是就是就是身体上就是控制不住，还是要继续去玩。<laughs> Wang Mai Long gives the parents the best image of the center. He invites them to come in to assess their son's situation. 有时候特别亲啊，有的时候，你就会对着干嘛？你孩子正常上学这个年龄，你在家了不去不去上学，你不看着不干着急吗？这最后没办法，就送过来送到这边。让他要出去工作，让他要为这个这个这个家庭要为他骄傲，嗯，可能跟这个学学业的压力啊，或者家庭的气，就就家庭的这种对孩子会对青少年这种，嗯。期望很高，然后他们会感觉到更多的压力，然后把这个游戏，把网络作为这个一种缓解压力的一个方式。Academic pressure explains why there are more youngsters addicted to gaming in Asia than in Western nations, a pressure that sparks tension between parents and children. 就是他们就是是让我出去一起晚上出去吃个饭，然后呢，然后我就不想去，然后说一起出去旅游，然后也不去。这就是我之前经常强调的，长时间在家上网的孩子会丧失一部分的社会功能。如果持持续下去，真的，我不愿意跟陌生人讲话了，胡浩宇的问题就就严重了。来，浩宇先生跟爸爸妈妈，这个这个谈一谈你在这的感受。那个特别感谢把你们把我送到这儿。你真的意识到了很多很多，所以我觉得浩宇怎么说呢？你现在进步是巨大的，也是明显的，但是要把这种效果持续下去。Since how you has been here, a new law has been passed. From now on, minors can play no more than an hour and a half per day. And officials have put a digital curfew in place between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. But the measure has technical limitations. The same type of law has been in place in South Korea since 2011 without any notable effect on youngsters. The scientific and medical communities agree that bans and discipline cannot be the sole responses to this issue, since video game dependence often masks something else. 就是我我们现在有一句话说，治疗游戏障碍本身，我们其实要，嗯，不是仅仅关注他游戏行为本身，一定要找到他为什么会有这样的行为。Is how you a veritable digital addict, or just a fragile kid taking refuge in video games to relieve the pressure that he can't cope with? Hard to say. But he will remain at Zenzing at least until the end of the year. Even if the reality in video game addiction remains a debatable subject in the scientific and medical worlds, the digital industry's techniques for keeping gamers riveted to their screens are now being blamed in some places around the world. Disparaged games are often those that involve killing a maximum of enemies popping up everywhere all at once. They are called first-person shooter games and can be very violent. 
Paradoxically, played daily, these action games actually improve certain brain skills. It's the unexpected discovery made in this laboratory. One of the first to become interested in what goes on inside gamers' brains. It all started in the 2000s, when a student at the lab, a big video game player himself, measured his own attention skills with a test that he had just developed. He was tasked with programming an attention test on the computer. And he kept thinking there was a bug in his computer code because he was perfectly uh, doing the task. He didn't have any lapse in attention. He was 100% correct all the time, which, according to the literature, should not have been possible. And then we worked together, and we discovered it was not a bug in his in this computer uh, program, it was really a bug in his brain because he was a video game player at the time. Since then, scientists have fairly well confirmed this unexpected discovery. Gamers who practice these first-person shooter games got the highest test scores for attention. Donc la première chose à savoir, c'est qu'on va mesurer vos capacités attentionnelles. Pour ça, on a besoin que votre regard soit fixe. Donc je vais vous demander d'installer votre menton sur ce petit appareil. OK, donc je vais vous donner les explications depuis cette pièce. Okay. Donc ce que vous voyez à l'écran, c'est un certain nombre de smileys bleus et un certain nombre de smileys jaunes. Les smileys bleus vont devenir jaunes. Et à la fin, l'un d'eux va porter un point d'interrogation. Et je vais vous demander de me dire si celui-ci était bleu ou jaune au départ de l'essai. OK La plupart des gens arrivent à faire ça, qu'ils soient gamers ou non gamers, c'est-à-dire avec trois points bleus au départ, on arrive relativement bien à les suivre. Avec quatre, euh, c'est un petit peu plus difficile. À cinq, on a perdu une bonne partie des non gamers. Et avec six, on n'a plus que les gamers qui arrivent à faire cette tâche. Some of these attentional tasks have been linked to improvement in everyday life, such as, for example, um, being less likely to have accidents, especially in elderly population. Greater attention means better ability at both focusing on the driving, the road ahead, but also detecting, like, you know, the dog that may be coming by or the kid with a balloon that uh, may be coming from the side. Ce qui est plus intéressant, c'est d'entraîner de, des gens qui ne sont pas des gamers euh, au départ à jouer à des jeux vidéo euh, d'action ou pas d'action. Et donc quand on fait ça et qu'on les entraîne pendant plusieurs semaines à raison d'une heure par jour, euh, pendant plusieurs jours par semaine, ce qu'on peut voir, c'est que ceux qui ont joué aux jeux d'action vont arriver à passer de 3 points à 4 points, alors que ceux qui n'ont pas joué aux jeux d'action restent à euh, une capacité de 4 euh, points bleus. It was quite inspiring to suddenly see something as mundane as playing first or third person shooter game have a rather um, unexpected effect, positive unexpected effect on core attentional function. Top-down attention is really this ability to, through your volition, pay attention. Um, so it's something very cognitive, very self-driven. And so that suddenly having a tool to enhance that aspect of attention seemed really interesting for a number of therapeutic applications. A video game as treatment. The apparently crazy idea has nevertheless given birth to a game developed in a West Coast laboratory in the USA. It was designed to treat attention disorders. My main goals are to both respond to only the red aliens by collecting them, which involves a button press, and to ignore all the others. So that's a selective attention decision. At first glance, you might think it is a platform game, but the list of actions to perform, the complexity, the pace, and the duration are all calibrated to push the brain to its limits, and specifically to reinforce attention skills. And I played it for a long time. Not the best. There are people that are, but I'm pretty good at it. It's a hard game. 
A double-blind clinical study evaluated the game's efficiency against a placebo. The tests carried out on 350 teenagers with attention deficits revealed significant improvements in their concentration capacities. As with any medicine, the prescribed dosage must be respected. We can deliver the experience at the pace that the intervention requires and limit use to 30 minutes per day. There are many mechanisms where you can actually control um, the intake, like the diet of the use. You can make sure that the main character are getting tired after a certain number of minutes, and then it will not be rewarding to play. If American health officials approve it as an effective medical treatment, Evo will become the very first medical video game on the market. The laboratory is already working on new digital therapies. Virtual reality may soon become another treatment for memory disorders. While paradoxical from all appearances, video games in medicine testify to the multiple uses of digital devices. Neither intrinsically good nor bad, it all depends on who uses them, for how long, and above all, in what way. According to experts, at high doses, screens do hinder children's development. So for the sake of caution, no screens ever before age three and after three, accompanied, if possible. Research on teenagers is still underway, but screen's addictive power makes the most vulnerable among teens more fragile. They also make existing problems worse. Given the already exorbitant place that screens now hold in our lives, moderation is advisable. The spread of 5G networks is sure to fuel global bulimia for all things digital.